Good evening, everybody. Hello, 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 hello. I am so happy that you are here and I am excited to be here with you for week 27 of Leadership Live. 2021 with Dr. Renita and friends. So yes, we are in week 27. And if we're in week 27 of Leadership Live, what does that also mean? We are in week 27 of 2021. That means you made it through 27 weeks or made it to 27 weeks. Let's say that. Yeah, made it to 27 weeks. That means you made it through 26 of those. And so that no matter what has happened with you in your life, you have been blessed to make it to this day. So welcome. I'm so excited that you are here. And you may be thinking, what in the world am I watching? And who is this lady? Well, first and foremost, Leadership Live is the sharing of journeys about leadership, about life, and how all of these things have worked for the good. And in 2019, I did it completely by myself for 52 weeks. I did Leadership Live and I just shared my journeys through leadership and different things I had going on and were able to share so many lessons learned with you. But it was tapped on my shoulder by God and he said, in 2021, I need you to do it again and I need you to bring on some friends. And so every single week I have been honored to have a different guest thus far. And here we are in week 27 with another amazing and fabulous guest. But who am I to even be talking to you and even think that I should be talking to these amazing people? Well, I am Dr. Renita L. Webb. I am an educational leadership strategist. And what that means is that I work with aspiring and growing leaders. I don't want anybody complacent or somebody who doesn't want to go to the next level, but I work with aspiring and growing leaders to become more authentic in their leadership, to learn how to greater empower their fellowship, and at the end of the day, make a, such a more lasting and positive, impressive impact on the world. That's what I do. I am also an authoress of Stepmom, Trials, Tribulations, and Triumphs, Editions 1 and 2, and that came from my mommy journey. I am also a mother of four. I birthed two children. I own two children. Yes, I, the two that I own, I fed them long enough and loved on them long enough. They are mine. They are mine all mine. Yes, they're mine. And my other two beautiful children who I had the opportunity to carry grow within and now they're here. I am also the author of While You're Sleeping, The Perfect Children of All Ages book. And it's just a beautiful bedtime story. You can read it anytime, but it's a beautiful bedtime story. And it was inspired a about my children because and how I look at them while they're sleeping. It's something about a sleeping child that just is so much more sweet than when they're awake <laughs> because they have a lot of fun. They're very vibrant when they're awake, but I love, 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 love praying for them, thinking about them and wondering about them while they're sleeping. I am also the founder of The Refining Life, a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide you with experiences so that your mindset can be shifted and you will lead a more positive and productive life. And we are gearing up for our seventh annual Refining the Mind Women's Conference in September. Information is out there if you want to learn more hit me up and or follow The Refining Life for information. It's going to be dynamic. I am also a veteran educator, having served grades kindergarten through college. And I am a queen. You said I am a queen, honey. A queen, queen. I'm a queen and I am a queen. I'm the current reigning East Coast USA National Talent Performer of the Year. I am the elite Southern Charms, North Carolina Ultimate Brand Supreme, as well as Mrs. Black, North Carolina. So not only do I carry myself as a queen in royalty, I actually have earn some crowns and get to represent these amazing systems in our community and hopefully and making a great positive impact there. But this week, oh, we gracious, I have a beautiful, amazing and talented guest with me. So let me go ahead and just bring her on in because she's fabulous. And there she is, Dr. T-A-S, Dr. Teresa. Very nice to have you here today. How are you doing? I am doing great, Dr. Renita. Doing great. I, I tell you, I met all of you, you know, when you're in uh, the presence of royalty. 
<laughs> All you can do is just bow down. Bow down. You know, we got our own princess right here today. <laughs> well, look, I, from the moment I met you, you were royal to me. You have always carried yourself as a queen. And I am honored to know you and to be in your presence and even still have a connection with you after all of the years that we've been apart. So this is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. It's so wonderful to be with you and your audience. You know, the topic of leadership, I'm just so glad that God inspired you to do it again. Because we can hear the same thing over and over again, but get different nuggets every time. And now you're able to bring other people on with you. So it's like, okay, I got my take on this. Now, what's their take on it? And then everybody learns. So I just think this is a wonderful concept. And congratulations on your 27th week. Also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I am going to take a step back and allow you the floor to tell the people about you and even a little smidge about our topic for this evening. All right. Well, as Dr. Renita said, I am Dr. Teresa A. Smith, a.k.a. Dr. Taz. I am a education leader. I've been in leadership probably my whole life. So let me just backtrack that some. You know, as a child, some people are all, you know, running, you know, barefoot, you know, at their grandparents' house. Well, I had an opportunity, and I do look at it as an opportunity, to actually be a Girl Scout, and that's leadership, to be started as a brownie. Then I became a Girl Scout. Then I was involved in the 4-H. Then I became the president of my local NAACP chapter. And that is where the door really opened up for me. I would go on to become the president of the North Carolina NAACP state uh, college and youth chapter uh, president. And from there, I had an opportunity to sit at the table. I don't want to name what year it was, but it was during the time period when North Carolina was looking at boycott and food line. And history is just history. And I had an opportunity to work along with some of our civil rights leaders and see how they actually worked in our favor, trying to make sure that we had the same access as others did. Well, at the time, I didn't realize I was really in a leadership uh, school. It was an academy. And so I was able to observe them, how they negotiated, how they maintained their cool how they were able to avoid certain things because we were planning to boycott, but they were able to come together with the organization, the company Food Line, and they were able to work out a deal. Well, you know, I had an opportunity to go to New York and be at the um, national conference at that particular time. Well, I'm on the dais with Dr. J. And of course, at that time, I really didn't understand who Julius Irving was. Now it'd be like, oh my God. And so he was like a seat down from me. But in hindsight, I realized that I was being exposed to all types of leaders because Dr. J was a leader on the court. I didn't understand it because I was so young. But the leaders that I was encountering, they were depositing different things in me. Now, you may say, well, were you uh, under mentorship with them? Some of them I was, but some just by observation. I was able to learn so much about being a leader. Fast forward, then I am in a school system. I'm working as a school counselor, and I would later become our state consultant for school counselors, social, work, social workers, and school psychologists. In that role, I was responsible for implementing what our state board of education in North Carolina had uh, mandated for those personnel. It also afforded me an opportunity to um, present to our state education committee. And that's our General Assembly State Education Committee on behalf of our state board slash our Department of Public Instruction. So again, opportunities continue to present themselves. Now I am an AKA, so I gotta put that out there. You know, you don't see the pink and green. Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated is the uh, premier uh, Greek led organization for women. We're the first. But not only is being first important, we have grown leaders since 1908. Since 1908. And so having an opportunity to work with some of the most phenomenal women in this world has ever produced, learning at their table, being able to see how they operated, how they were able to maneuver. Again, it's like another academy. I'm continuing to be educated sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly. 
afforded opportunities to implement programming, policies, procedures, protocol that only strengthen whatever event, but more importantly, it strengthens me. So our topic today is about resiliency and emotional intelligence, or EQ. All of the individuals I've had an opportunity to work with, that I've had an opportunity to observe, the one thing that I look at that was really phenomenal about all of them, and I'm going to just say this like we're on the street, they were able to maintain their cool. No matter what was going on behind the scenes, and you know, I had access to what was happening behind the scenes, but they were always able to maintain their composure. And that always fascinated me. And so now, of course, we talk about it from an emotional intelligence perspective, but also it's a part of resiliency because they were being bombarded with uh, situations, um, individuals that could have derailed whatever they were about to implement, but they were able to maintain their emotional intelligence or their uh, cool and then go forth as a leader and implement everything that they were doing to fidelity. And to me, that is fascinating. And you don't have to be the Dr. J. You don't have to be um, the president of Alpha Kappa Alpha. You don't have to be our state superintendent. You don't have to be in the legislature or even in Washington in order to practice this. We have to practice this every day in our life on our job. You know, currently I am the academic faculty director um, at Capella University, and I have to practice that. You know, I practice it with my leaders that I report to. I practice it with the faculty that report to me. And I have over 100 uh, part-time and adjunct faculty who report to me. But yet and still, I have to maintain that that emotional intelligence. So I think that as we look at leadership during this time that we're going to spend together, we're going to find that, you know, we can break it down to some of the simpler parts because that's what I'm all about. You know, I like simple because we get a lot of the rhetoric, which sometimes is a bit overwhelming for individuals. So if you follow me on Talk with Taz, which is my show that is on Facebook, you will find that I'm always speaking from a personal development perspective. It's all about personal development. As a leader, if I am not um, aware of my strengths, my weaknesses, opportunities, and what could be a threat to me, then it makes me less effective. So really, we have to do the work within ourselves. And that's what my focus is all about. And my first book, Stronger, How Overcoming Life's Adversity Can Push You Into Your Purpose. I talk about my journey. And that book is about resiliency. All about resiliency and how you can overcome whatever you have been encountering. In my second book, From Bravery to Victory, I give you a precursor to Stronger. I have a book coming out this summer. It's called Transformation. Transformation is very transformative, a play on words, but it's transformative because what I've done is I've taken some life lessons and I've then given us questions. So you can look at it as a um, a workbook, but then it's a self-help. Whatever word works for you, whatever doesn't frighten you, but it's about you doing what you need to do to become the best person that you need to be. And that's for any aspect of your life. I didn't want to typecast the book because you can use it for anything that you're trying to improve in. But it does mean that you have to do the work that is responsible for your growth. You can't pass it on to someone else. And certainly when it comes to resiliency and when it comes to emotional intelligence, again, transformation is about all of that and you have to do the work. And those are things that as leaders and particularly as women, leaders, we have to be so mindful of. The stereotypes are still out there. And so we have to always guard how we present ourselves because, you know, as someone said to me recently, um, now I have to think, now am I going to say this? I have to think quickly. I'm going to change how I'm going to say this. As I was prepping for something, I did not want to be considered as the angry Black woman. I wanted them to understand that I was advocating. I was being assertive. 
not aggressive. Because if they viewed it as aggressive, then the stereotype may come in. And I did not want them to stereotype me nor the situation. So again, I am looking forward to dialoguing with Dr. Renita on this topic of leadership and how do we navigate our emotions that sometimes take hold and really it can derail us and we're not as uh, successful as we want to be in whatever it is that we're going at at that moment. Well, let me tell you, there are 803 notes. On my paper. I know we have limited time, but my goodness, there are so many different avenues where we could just dive into. Your experiences are so rich. And you brought up something that I think we don't discuss enough, um, especially as Afri African-Americans who've had opportunity to join and participate with Greek letter organizations. Oh my, switch, switch. <laughs> uh, so actually, let's start there. Why not? So I think about even, you know, Considering um, the divine nine. So for those of you all who do not know, I'm going to try my best not to speak in lingo terms or jargon that not everyone knows. The divine nine are nine African-American Greek letter organizations um, that have created this bond, for lack of a better word. And they started with the first two, which are Alpha Phi Alpha which was found in 1906. Yes, hear me when I say 1906. Okay, over 100 years. Don't get it twisted. Mm -hmm. And so that was the first fraternity. The first sorority was founded in 1908, as Dr. Toss told us, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Now, I will say this, while I support all Greek letter organizations, I am not a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha. I am a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority in, got to say it with a lean, Incorporated. Oh, I love you. <laughs> I love you, my sister. Yes. And so, and th that's something else I want people to see. And even though for years, and, and you know, I pledged an undergrad, you know, it gets a little catty crazy <laughs> um, because everyone is very proud of their organization. And so in undergraduate, sometimes you will hear all the foolery, all of it. And even with, uh, I have friends who I actually probably are in all of the divine nine sororities. Um, and we mess with each other all the time, but please do not ever come from it for any of my sisters in any of the Greek organizations because I'll hurt your feelings. I don't care what organization they're a part of. Yes, mm -mm, don't do it. <laughs> we can mess with each other. Nobody else can. But there is, so thinking about organizations that the, the, of the first of the nine started in 1906 and 1908, and here we are in 2021, and the divine nine still exists. So that in itself, can tell you about resiliency and think about what was going on in our country in 1906, 1908, 1911, 1913, 1920, 1922. Think about what's going on in our country and these organizations not only started but flourished. And they produced this legacy of individuals who continue these organizations. Talk about resiliency. And there is not there is not one of these organizations that does not teach leadership. Mm -hmm. If you join, you are learning from the moment you start a process about leadership, about resiliency, about understanding emotions and, and navigating all of these things. So I love that you bought that up because I think that people underestimate the power of not only having these organizations, but the process of joining and maintaining your membership and your leadership, no, whether you have a title or not within these organizations. It is a journey like none other. It is, um, Renita. And, you know, I'm glad that you're drawing that out because um, a lot of people, there are only knowledge of the divine nine or the 
the sororities or the fraternities is what they see on TV. Right. And sometimes what they see in the media is not the most positive things uh, because that's when we get a lot of uh, airtime. But when you talk about leadership, you know, and I can only speak from Alpha Cap Alpha perspective, but because I've, I've lived Alpha Cap Alpha, but I know it's the same in some of the other organizations because I have friends and brothers, you know, in the Greekhood who are a part. It is all about leadership. Yes, we have fun. Don't get me wrong. And even at the undergraduate level, they're having fun, but it's still leadership training yeah. 101. I yeah. mean, you you walk out of college as a leader because those individuals, our, founding, our founders, um, they understood the importance of leadership. They understood if we were going to progress in this country, we had to create leaders. So not only was it good for our um, people to be able to go to Howard University or to other universities and graduate, go back to their community as professionals, they had to have leadership skill. And it's the same now, I may have all the academic knowledge, but I don't know how to apply that knowledge outside of my job. So what are you saying, Taz? I can be effective in my job, but when it comes to helping my community, I don't have the leadership skill to help grow the community because it's two different things. Because what I can do on my job, I cannot do in the community. Now, let me bring this home for you. You know, on the job, I get a paycheck. So I get up every morning, I you know shower, I try to be cute some mornings, and then I leave the house and I go to work. At the end of a two week period or a month period, whatever your pay cycle is, you get a paycheck. So that's how the job shows you appreciation. Good. For organizations, you get up, you do all this work to serve a community, to serve your fellow man. Uh, at the end of the week, at the end of the event, at the end of the month, the year, whatever, there is no paycheck. Right. You pay to serve. So mm -hmm. you have to have a, a servant heart. You have to understand that what you're doing is bigger than you. Because if you're doing it for notoriety, it gets old real soon. Real quick. Sorry. I mean, you know, I'm doing all this work. And I can remember the things that I did, you know, when I was much younger uh, in the sorority. And, you know, folks have come back and said to me, oh, yeah, I remember you as the... Um, Tennis shoes, Sora. And I said, tennis shoes, Sora? Because I didn't know what they meant. They were like, yeah, every year you would have on tennis shoes. And every year they kept changing. Well, what was happening was, because they were telling the truth, I was the, um, for the regional director at the time, I was her logistical officer for her conferences. So what does that mean? We had these huge conferences, three, 4,000 people at regional level. And then when you talk national, we're talking... <laughs> we have 40, 50,000 people there. And, and I've worked uh, at the national conferences also. But at the regional conference, what was happening was I was responsible for making sure that everything that needed to happen to make sure every event occurred properly took place. Well, that's a skill set. I'm sorry, it's a skill set, but it still goes back to leadership. Now, I can't leave my mom out and then I'll connect the dot. Now, my mother is an amazing woman and she made sure that I had every opportunity as it related to leadership. So I talked about some things and then I left out the fact that I was an Eastern Star. I was a gleaner. That's the youth department. I was also in another organization in, in their youth department. So I grew up in leadership. It wasn't just the things that I mentioned as far as Girl Scouts and Brownie and all that, I grew up in leadership. And my mother, you know how it is when you got a Southern mother or any mother, you're going to do what she's doing. You're going to help her out. So when she would have her banquet, she would have me working. So I learned how to decorate. I learned about ticket sale. I learned about the money. I learned about being responsive to the guests. And my mother wanted to make sure that her guests were served. Because my mother is like that. She's real, you know, she's like that. So I had to, once I was old enough, you know, we would, the men would bring out, the Masonic brothers would bring out the food on trays. And then the ladies would help, you know, plate, they would put the food down for the guests, just as if you were in a restaurant. Well, I had to help with that. I understood what was taking place for the event. 
Well, my mother really was teaching me logistics. She was teaching me protocol. I didn't understand it. I just knew I had to help do these things. Well, you fast forward 20 some years later. Now I'm in a position where I am the logistical officer for a regional director. And so when it came to her conferences, we've got all the people there, but they're moving parts. And everybody has a role to play, but the logistical person has to make sure that all the moving parts are taking place smoothly, smooth, smooth, regardless of how they fall apart. When you sit in the audience, you're not supposed to notice anything is wrong. And so I was in tennis shoes because I would go in. I had to make sure everything was set up before the event started. Mm -hmm. And once people were coming in, I would be making sure things were working the way they should. And I was an usher. My mother was an usher. So I learned this. So, you know, I would be ushering. They didn't realize that's what I was doing, but that's what I was doing because I'm trying to seat people. And sometimes people are having a problem. I'm rushing to take care of them. And then once this event, like I made in our plenary session, which means that's where everybody's together in this one huge room. Once that event was good, then I walk out because now I have to make sure the next event is ready to go. It could be a luncheon. It could be workshop. It could be it could be a ribbon cutting. It doesn't matter. My job is now to move on to the next event to make sure everything is good to go. So when the Saras were like, oh, yeah, you are the tennis shoe, Sarah. I had to be in tennis shoes because I was going from event to event. I wasn't there to enjoy the conference. Right. I was there to serve the organization as a whole, the larger organization, serve the regional director, serve the region, serve my Saras, and serve any guests when guests could be present. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as they said, your tennis shoes started to change. Yeah, they changed because I thought, now, you know, you are, this is out of let me be honest. You just can't be any big tennis shoes, even though I needed them for support. So then I would try to make them cuter, but I'm running, running, running. But at the same time, I would not have been able to manage that if I hadn't had a, a teacher, which really my first teacher was my mom, who helped me to understand emotional intelligence. Because understand, when you got a lot of women together, you know how we are. Tell I'm that story. Real. I'm being <laughs> real. And, and, and we, we dress to the nines. Absolutely. Dress to the nines. And I'm going to put it out that there's sometimes we are in our meek. You hear me? Because it depends upon the weather. So they in their minks, they in their diamonds, they got the real diamonds. I ain't talking like the stuff I got. They got the real diamonds. And, you know, sometimes it's a little heated because we get a little impatient. Mm -hmm. It's not my fault. But, of course, if somebody wants to vent to me, I got to take it like a champ. Absolutely. That's emotional intelligence. Absolutely. Because I haven't done a thing wrong. But the person is letting me have it. And I, I can't respond in a negative way. My voice remains soft and just pleasant. I'm so sorry. Let me see if I can find a resolution for you. I will be back. It may take me a few moments, but I will come back. And if I can resolve it, I come back with a resolution. If I can't resolve it, I go back so that I can tell them that I couldn't come up with a solution. You know, I'm sorry that this has happened to you because again, my credibility is based upon my word. So we're still talking leadership now. We're still talking leadership mm -hmm. because a leader's word should mean something. If it doesn't mean anything, come on with me now. If right. it don't mean anything, you're not much of a leader. Now, I, so, you know, I, I have to go to Jesus. I'm sorry, because, you know, he talks to me and he walks with me and tells me that he's on. Now, you know, he told them he was going to die and he was going to get up three days later. They didn't understand what that meant because right. they weren't accustomed to people. They're accustomed to lots of things. But, you know, somebody tell you they're going to die and they're going to get up. Now, when you're dead, you're dead. You know, I mean, you know, they said this in a movie years ago. I love it first bite. And then, you know, Sherman Hensley's up preaching. He's like, when you is dead, you is dead. And George <laughs> rises up out the casket and says, good evening. Now, that was George Hamilton. That don't really happen. That was a movie. But with Christ, it did. His word meant something. Mm -hmm. meant something. That's leadership. He was training the disciples as they walked with him so they could then go out and then serve others. So when I say that my word meant something, it meant something. Right. So if I said, let me go check on that. 
whether it was a favorable outcome or not so favorable outcome, I still had to go back to that individual and deliver that information. Absolutely. Likewise, it's the same in jobs. Sometimes you have to give folks some news that they don't want to hear, particularly with performance evaluations. Uh, oh, yes. I mean, you got to do it. And it's like, you know, I can hear my AKA um, mentor saying you have to put on your big girl panties. You have to put on your big girl panties and try to, from my counseling hat, I always try to sandwich it, say mm -hmm. something positive and then kind of slide in that not so positive and then end mm -hmm. on a positive because so then it makes it a little easier to digest. Uh, but unfortunately, as the leader, I'm going to have to do that. So we've talked about Alpha Kappa Alpha. We've talking about work and then performance evaluations. I've even brought in Christ, but it's still leadership. Absolutely. Still leadership. But you know what? So uh, let me, for those of all who have been listening and maybe you haven't connected some some of these things. So, so just the go back mm -hmm. and letting your word be your bond word is bond. That's what this is where it comes from. Letting your word be your bond. But that, I mean, so for leadership terms, when mm -hmm. people are looking at traditional leadership terms, it's called follow up. Yes. Follow, <laughs> follow up. up. Even if it's something that you cannot change. So I think about when I was a school principal, mm -hmm. one of the things, you know, we, I, once again, you got, I got sat on, cried on, fussed out, cussed out. And a lot of times it really was not me, but I could not change their desire. I could not change what the outcome was. It, and some of it, we maybe we could talk about and make some adjustments with other parties. But if I couldn't, I couldn't. And if I shouldn't, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, I, some things I probably could, but I was not going to because it would not be ethical. Yeah. And so as a principal, you had to you, you have to deal with these things and you know what? I'm going to ask the teacher about this or I'm going to go observe this. Let me do some research because as a leader, you are a researcher. You are an investigator. Let me go research so I can follow up with you. And that's exactly what you were doing at those conferences. I, honey, when you get to talk about plenary sessions and workshops and Ooh, if I didn't go to regional and national conference real quick in my mind, but also, I mean, I, I have a nonprofit organization. We do women's conferences every year, it, whether it's 10,000, 20,000, 40,000, 30,000, 4,000, 1,000, or 10. Yes. It still has to operate in the same ways. It still has to be logistically sound and you still have to have the same EQ because you're still dealing with people. Mm -hmm. Know that if you ever deal with people, you need to find, work on, study emotional intelligence. You've got, because you're dealing with individuals and in order for us to work together, in order for us to get to a desired end, in order for us to even start communicating effectively, we've got to know where each other is coming from. We've got to understand what things may be triggers. Yes. Um, we've we've got to get to that point and be sensitive to them, deal with them, be present in them so that we can move forward so that our resiliency can even have an opportunity to, to take stage. We sometimes kill ourselves, mm -hmm. kill our goals. We kill our possibilities. We kill our teams, our organizations, because we're not willing to understand the other person. So there are people who have never heard of a plenary session. There are people who have never been to a workshop, a conference. So they don't understand why you have an, on your, a, a clipboard, a minute by minute, play by play of how this day has to go or what the expectation mm -hmm. is, because there are going to be a million things that happen in that. But if you bring somebody on board with you, let's say that you are an entrepreneur yes. and you are br bringing on an onboarding staff. And one of the things that you do is maybe host workshops or you host a conference and you're bringing on an administrative assistant. And now you are expecting them to do logistics, but maybe they've never lived that life. And it's an emotional time to deal with that many people at once. But once again, whether it's 10 or 10,000. You've got to help them understand and get them to the point where you talk to them, you take time out of your day just to talk about different personalities. Mm -hmm. 
to talk about different people's leadership styles, to talk about different personality traits, do a Myers-Briggs. Yes. Understand who they are, what they are, what their experiences have brought them to. And so that you all can work together. And once you learn your ebb and flow, you can start talking about the ebb and flow with other people. It's just, it's a bouncing act like none other. And organizations like the Girl Scouts, I was blessed to be a Girl Scout, been there. Yes. Organizations like Greek Letter Organizations, the uh, Eastern Star, Masonic, um, and any other organizations that have these youth programs that are connected to them. Mm -hmm. So I think about Delta, we have Delta Gyms. Mm -hmm. bring, you know, we bring young ladies in, we help to guide them. I'm, I'm pretty sure the fraternities have these organizations, I mean, these um, opportunities as well. Helping the youth and starting them young. Churches, churches do this. A lot of churches do this. I, I know black church does this. I'm pretty sure other churches do this, but I can speak from my black church experience. You have youth programs. And in the youth program, I grew up AME Zion. So, you know, very international. The children, you're going to bring them in. They have their own leadership councils and they're making decisions. Mm -hmm. Learning to work with each other. It is matters and it changes the way we we work as effective adults as effective leaders in adult it does Renita and you know you talked about so many things and triggers and you talked about um you know when you're onboarding individuals and you know even with our relationships our one-on-one -on -one relationships listening is so important and we say active listening and you know I have to work on this too guys active listening means I have to be fully present because I was making a couple of notes when you were talking. So I was fully present instead of being in my head, thinking about what my response is going to be, because I only hear a portion of what you say. And I'm already thinking about the response. Well, if I could have stayed actively engaged, I may have really understood what you were trying to say. Then I can add to the conversation, add to building a rapport with the individual versus unintentionally taking away or detracting from that. And, and you know, that's so important. So like you said, with triggers, that could be a trigger for someone. And I would not even know that. And you talk about Myers-Briggs, you know, I'm still a firm believer on finding out how people learn because it impacts how I give feedback to them. I was speaking with a faculty member yesterday um, in my real job, guys, you know how you got them real job. And so she she had a question about a student, and I understood. I thought what she was asking me, but I'm like, okay, she's not asking the right question because I'm all about asking the right question. Because if you ask the right, if you can figure out what the right question is, you'll get the answer that you're looking for. So I'm quick about saying, you know, I emailed her back and said, give me a call. So she called me, and so what I found out was she didn't understand what the policy was. So something had occurred that shouldn't have happened. And now the student is trying to do something that can't happen because the faculty member didn't understand the policy. And as I said to her, if we had not gotten on the phone and talked, I would never have understood that you didn't understand the policy because mm -hmm. I talked about other scenarios that could present. And she said to me, oh, I never thought about that. And I said, oh. I understand that. And oh, I'm so glad we're having an actual conversation besides emails. And then I told her how to draft the email response back to me because it needed to be said a certain way before I can take that up the chain. And yeah. you know, in leadership, you don't want to put anything on paper that you don't want to be used as evidence later. Because yeah. it's evidence. And so even though she didn't realize it, she may get in a couple of years when she's doing something in leadership. I was training her when I did that yeah. because she didn't know that. And I said, you know, we don't want to put it on paper. I said, this is how I, I didn't dictate it, dictate it. But I told these are what we're going to say. And this you're going to say this, you're going to say that. And the you know, things that you told me include that. Because, again, and then I said, and you sum it up this way. Now, how would, how do, how would I address this? My tone. I wanted that tone to be there too, and so even and I, you know how I do it because you hear me doing it, you see me. But it's the tone. I wanted the tone to be appropriate because I know we got a slight pickle, a slight little pickle there, and uh, I don't know how we're going to address this pickle. But I want it to be 
I want the tone to be appropriate and that's verbal, that's written tone. I want the message to be appropriate. All of that has to do with emotional intelligence. All of it has to do with appropriate communication. You can be the best person possible, but if you cannot communicate with the, in, the audience the way that you need to, then that, that kind of undermines what you're able to do. Or let me say it a different way. It Im impedes your effectiveness That's because right. efficiency and effectiveness is so important. The return on investment, and I can talk that language because I got an MBA, but you know, I don't like to talk that language, but I'll talk about this for a moment. But that return on investment, the ROI is so important. So whether you are in the leader or you are aspiring to a particular position, when you're in an interview, if they can't determine that the return on our own investment, the ROI is going to meet their business need, then they pass on you. So that's the part that we don't understand. They pass on you. There's a reason why, because you don't meet the business need. You're not, they're not willing to put that investment in you because of where you are at that point. It doesn't mean that you're not qualified. Right. It's just that you don't meet their business need. So when it comes to being a leader, you have to understand your audience, regardless of what the situation is, so that you know how to then interface with them. You have to learn the language. When I moved into this current position, you know, we talk about pivoting. Well, pivoting is the new word now in business. Also, we talk about how we're going to cascade um, communication down to uh, staff or whomever, you know, so I had to pick up that language. I'm like, okay, so that's what we're using now. I quickly had to pick it up because I, in order for me to be effective, I have to use the, elang the language that's used in my organization. Absolutely. Um, again, it's about resiliency. You may say, well, what are you, how, how is that resiliency? Because resiliency is not just for me in a bigger picture, it's being able to shift when you need to shift. Mm -hmm. That's what makes resiliency so important. We talk about grit, but grit and resiliency is being able to adapt to certain situations, to circumstances, to individual as you need to. And, and that's, be successful in it. It's, thank you so much. And be successful because some people can adapt. You're right, Renita, mm -hmm. but they're not successful. But right. the, the, the person who is in touch with their they're listening. They're in touch with other people's learning styles. They're in touch with nonverbals because you have to read people's nonverbals. That's the reason the tone was so important for that email, because I needed to when it hits the person, I need to hit them the right way. They so, need to have the right emotional response. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Emotional yes. response. Absolutely. Yes. But I, so I, I love that you talk about emails. Um, and so, and you actually talked about this earlier and I, whew, I wish, girl, we, I feel like we need another hour. <laughs> we got a little extra time. We got a little extra time. <laughs> but um, you, earlier when you were introducing yourself, you were talking about mentorship and observation. And so even the minute mentorship that occurs when you are having conversation, even if uh, about something like a performance evaluation, I feel like that is such an amazing opportunity to provide that mentorship moment if the other person will allow it. But that also has to do with emotional intelligence. Oh, no. Right. But as you were guiding her through that email, after you all had had this conversation, because emotionally you all were able to connect and communicate. And now you've gotten to this place where you're going towards a common goal. Yes. And so the goal is to get this email formulated in a way that when it goes up the chain, it will have the correct emotional response but it had to emotionally tie to the person who would be reading it. And, right, so the jargon in your organizations, so this is why you have to understand the jargon, because if you understand what to say and how to say it, it can be the exact same thing whether you're working at McDonald's, if you're working in the White House. It doesn't matter. You're trying, It's the same thing, but it's said a different way. You've got to say it that way to get to the emotion. On the other side, mm -hmm. this is what. So for for you all who are like, oh, where are they? Oh, oh, oh. No, we are all. It's, it all comes back to the same thing. Mm -hmm. Communication words. I, I was an English major in undergrad, so I I love words. Words matter. The word you choose to use in a moment can be a butt whooping from your parent yes. or a hug. 
Yes. <laughs> because of the words you chose. And I had wonderful aunties who always, they jumped on us. You know, if you said, you know, where is my cousin at behind the preposition at? Mm-hmm. Okay. Can I? Can you do this for me? Yes, I can. But do you? What's that real question? And I find I find them living through me. My children ask, "Mommy, can you get me a sandwich?" I sure can. I have the ability to get you that sandwich. But what do you really want to know? Uh-huh. Mommy, will you get me a sandwich? Yes, I will. Yeah. And so words matter. And in these different industries and places in life. They understand certain words because that's the words of their organization. That's that's the heartbeat. That's that will evoke the emotions you desire. Mm-hmm. And so know what you're trying to get and then use the words and the language to get you there. So that's where EQ matches communication. Mm-hmm. And if you are especially a lot of times this this heart trudge through creating an email um, has to do with your 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 faith in the adverse situation and you're trying to get to a certain goal. Well, you have to be resilient to keep going there. You have to have the grit to go through the work to get to where you desire to be. And if you do it and you do it right, you will see the results you desire. Absolutely. But, but we need, but you know, you know, it's hard work. Now, do people really want to put this hard work in? Because you know, it's not easy. A lot of people don't, which is why a lot of people don't activate their leadership powers. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, I will say, most of the world, most of the individuals in the world have a leadership ability, even if it's, it may not be to lead an organization, it may just be to lead your own life. Yes. But some people don't even activate that power. Mm-hmm. Because they allow themselves to be dragged along through life by the powers, uh, leadership powers of other people, uh, other ideals. They don't activate their own leadership power within. Because then not only is it work, but it brings its responsibility. Yes. Yes. So it is, people don't want that. No, because, you know, we talk about just for myself, you know, advocacy. Learning how to advocate for myself, be it on the job, be it for my medical care, be it going to buy a car. You know, learning how to advocate for yourself. But as you said, a lot of people don't want the responsibility because it is some work. Because everything that we've talked about, you still got to know the audience. You still got to know how to communicate with them. So you just can't go in and just do it. You know, it's still work. And for me, sometimes when I think about it, it's like, do you enjoy being a leader? And I know I shouldn't be asking this question uh, in this public um, for, <laughs> but it's it's reality. Yes, and you know, for me, I don't know anything else because I've always been a leader. You know, a friend of mine said years ago, she's like, everything you get in, you're always in a leadership role. But that's the way it's always been. I don't know another life, you know. But it's not an easy life. And I will say this for the audience also: sometimes it's a very lonely life. Mm-hmm. Lonely life, because remember, people see you one way. And do I want to use the vice president? I'm going to use the vice president, uh, our current vice president, as a as an example. We are very proud of our vice president, the first African American. You know, she's AKA too. She uh, is. <laughs> <laughs> first African American or the first female of color. Um. Um. Vice President of the United States. But, you know, the Vice President, that can be a lonely role for any person. Absolutely. Because it is a role. And whether it's male or female, there's still things that go along with it, but they're also still a person. But thinking about it with the female, since we have our first female Vice President of Color, I wonder how she balances her drive to make a difference with her need for her own personal, um, how do I want to say this? Balance. I'm going to use the word balance because she has to balance her inner personal self, her opinions with her professional um, responsibilities. And but I think hard. right. So so it's so this is a question that I get from my clients as well as you know just different people. Um, it's how do you authentically show up 
and be authentically yourself while still towing the line mm -hmm. of professionalism or organizational obligations and expectations. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard because you can't say everything you think. Nope. But let, let's go to this reality. In real life, no matter what you're attached to, you can't always say what you think because what you think may not always be right. <laughs> and maybe you haven't done enough research mm -hmm. in your mind and you may come out and say something that is the wrongest of wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> but particularly when you are representing an entire country, even more so you have to question whether or not what you're getting ready to say and do is going to be detrimental to your position, mm -hmm. yourself. You know, sometimes we self-sacrifice way more than we would sacrifice for another organization like we will we will toward the line to represent something else better than we would represent ourselves but but then that's that self-discovery so just like you said you know when you are working with individuals with organizations you, it's personal first and you know when you ask any of my coaching clients that's the first you know they want to say well i want to do this da, 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 da. great let's start with you do you know you and some of us are having difficulties being authentic because we don't even authentically know who we are. Mm -hmm. We are not honest with ourselves about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. But once you know that, you know how to let her or him show up in whatever you do. They will always be there, even if it's dressed different, even if it's walking different, even if it's using different jargon. It's, she is always there. She is present. No matter how she has to present it for you to get it, for you to emotionally connect with it. And that's so powerful um, because when you were talking, I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about our two most recent, well, I was thinking about President Biden and then I was thinking about President Trump because they, their personalities are ever present. Ever present. Yeah, because it's not, it's not about politics with me, but Joe Biden's personality is there. Mm -hmm. You get that in everything that he does. President Trump's, um, former President Trump, his personality was in everything that he does. Okay. So again, you know, they're being authentic. They're being genuine. The thing is learning when to modulate that. Right. And that's the hard thing. And so like I said, when I think about, well, do I love leadership? Yeah, I do. Because I'm going to be me regardless, you know, depend upon the audience. I'll switch it up and I can go real academic sounding. But I don't <laughs> like that, you know, uh, because as a person who's been on the receiving end, you lose people. Absolutely. They tune you out. I'm sorry. They tune you out. So you have to, you know, someone said to me, do you have to entertain people? Yes, you do. Because we have short attention spans and everything is competing for our attention span. So, yes, you need to entertain folks now in order to keep their attention span. But also that goes with when we're talking about leadership, it goes to helping develop relationships, nurture relationships, helping to maintain and sustain relationships. Absolutely. Because your employees, whether they're your employees, they're getting paid. But people who are volunteering that might be working like in your nonprofit, if you don't get to know them on a personal level, you don't know what what their expectations are. You don't know what their aspirations are. And then, therefore, you're not able to connect and keep them motivated. And right. motivation is so important when you're being a leader. Uh, and for me, the emotional intelligence of the leader is responsible for helping keep everyone else motivated right. because I provide the extrinsic motivation that hopefully will attach to their intrinsic. Absolutely. Then we've got a winner. Absolutely. Well, whew, okay. Like I said, we could have an entire separate hour to discuss all the things that just the notes, because so many things I didn't even touch from my notes, but our hour is expiring. And I promise you all, I promise you, audience, I'm going to have a special conversation with Dr. Tan about something else. Just keep your eyes out. Know that she may show up somewhere else doing something in the near the further future that could help all of our lives. OK, but there, once again, there's so many things, but emotional intelligence, resilience, grit 
communication, relationships, all of it is leadership. And if you are not willing to deal with even the minute portions of it, it could cause you not to get to the place where you need to be in life or in business, whatever you're trying to do. So attach to it, grow with it, be aware of it, work on it. But I know, I know that I know that people are like, oh my goodness, Dr. Vernita, thank you so much for introducing us to Dr. Taft. I need to stay close to her. I need to stay in contact with her. How do they do that? What's the best way for them to do that? The best way for them to stay in contact with me is they can follow me on LinkedIn or reach out to me on LinkedIn. It's Dr. Teresa A. Smith, a.k.a. Dr. Taz. Uh, I'm Dr. Teresa Smith on Instagram. I'm also um, Talk with Taz on Facebook. And you can also find me uh, on Twitter as Ask Dr. Taz, the number one. Ask Dr. Taz, number one. Uh, but you can find me. You can find me. Uh, so please reach out. I love to hear your feedback on some of the things that we discussed tonight. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I am once again blessed and honored to continue to have you in my life and my tribe and my circles. Um, you are absolutely phenomenal. And for everyone else out there, know that you've just gotten some great tidbits. <laughs> If you walked away from this one with nothing, I don't know what else I could do for you. <laughs> so many things. Keep keep, keep on your EQ. Work on your resilience and know that the only way to work on resilience is to continue to face adversity yes. and strive to meet the goal. You got to face it. You got to face it. I'm going to stay in contact with Dr. Toss. I hope you do too. But I want to say thank you for being my guest for week 27. I told you all, I'm not letting you down this year. 27 weeks of amazing has happened. And know that I will be right back here next Monday at 9 p.m. again with another amazing guest for week 28 of Leadership Live 2021. And as always, I encourage you to always, always, always keep your leadership all the way live. I'll see you next week. Bye.